Hello and welcome back to Potty Mouth, the show where the jokes are dirty and the minds are dirtier. I'm Aaron, this is Blake. Hey, you do. And today on the podcast, we're going back in time. Uh-oh. To a place where no one has... Well, people have been there before, but it's a long time ago and I'm ruining this. So we're talking about old sex. Uh, <laughs> more accurately, we're talking about historic sex. Um, and basically sexual trends throughout history, as well as things that may or may not have been told. Um, to you in school, or you haven't read on BuzzFeed or whatever. The so, caveman. Do you know any like interesting facts about um, historic sex or like sexual trends throughout time? No idea. Okay, cool. So we're. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm gonna be the teacher again. So okay. Hi. <laughs> so um, as you know, things have adapted and changed and evolved over the course of centuries. Um, sex has changed multiple times in the way we act, the way we interact, and the way we do and things we do. So I'm assuming you knew that sex today isn't what it was. Oh, definitely. Okay, cool. Um, I'm sure there wasn't <clears throat> a sex swing in the 30s. I mean, you never know. <laughs> there, is, there could be some crazy crap going on. I am so sorry, guys. My, uh, my, my pop filter is kind of being a little butt today. I'm going to just see if I can twist it around. Make my life a little easier. Maybe? I don't know. Aha! Nope, it didn't no. work. Oh. It did not help. Whatever, it's fine. Um, so today we're going to go through some historic facts about sex. Whoop whoop. Yeah, so... Um, <clears throat> anyway, so in ancient Egypt, we're starting back way long time ago. We're talking about 3100 to 320 or 332 BC. Hmm, I wonder if this is still true today. So, <laughs> back in ancient Egypt, actually, so there's actually a lot of cool things about ancient e about ancient Egypt. Um, so ancient Egyptians were one of the first pe peoples to use makeup. Um, right. They also believed in be being completely hairless due to hygiene. So they were the first ones to implement a really strict hygiene um, like regimen. Yeah. Um, so um, in regards to sex uh, or the historical part of it, so having lipstick on meant that you were open to oral. Um, oral sex was practiced in most ancient societies uh, because, duh, oral sex is fun. But ancient Egyptians are often noted as particularly enamored of going down so much that one of their most important myths centers around a blowjob given to a clay penis. So we're talking about, not only we're talking about blowjobs, we're also talking about the first dildo. Interesting. Yeah. So which brings us back to the <laughs> god... You're good. Excuse me. You're good. So, which brings us back to the god Osiris, um, or excuse me. So, there's a there's a myth that centers around a blowjob being given to a clay penis, which brings the god Osiris. Oh, I can't pronounce it. O Osiris. Osiris back to life. Um. So anyway, the ancient Egyptians' enthusiasm for oral sex is credited by some historians with creating another cornerstone of modern society, lipstick. So they did, we're talking about the makeup in ancient Egypt and that they created lipstick. Um, Egyptians are often thought to have been the first ones to wear makeup. Uh, under this theory, the Egyptian enthusiasm for makeup and oral sex collided when ancient Egyptian courtesan, courtesans, yeah, publicized their oral prowess by coloring their lips, a practice that eventually evolved evolved into the modern red lipstick classic thing that you like. Interesting. Any questions? So far, why would clay, a clay dick? So, so okay. So have you ever heard of like ancient, like Egyptian, like the gods and how they believed in the yeah. like God for everything? So there's, a, there's an Egypt, Egyptian myth that centers around a blowjob being given to a clay penis, which brought the god Osiris back to life. I'm curious on how big they made this dick. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a god dick. Who knows? <laughs> a god dick. <laughs> a god dick. Bam! <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what are you doing today, Osi Osiris? Well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> it's not what I'm doing. <laughs> it's what you're doing oh that that went that went okay we went there um moving on to ancient rome uh we're talking about 753 bc to 476 a.d 
Um, and we're talking about the a belief in aphrodisiac food was common in a lot of ancient cultures, including ancient Rome. Since you can't believe that some foods get you horny without believing that others do the opposite, some Romans believed that certain foods possessed anti-aphrodisiac qualities, particularly lettuce. Ancient Romans were suspicious, suspicious of lettuce, which they believed could instantly render men impotent. Oh, shoot. So Roman males tended to avoid the green stuff, which I can only assume led to a lack of fiber in their diet. A lot of, <laughs> a lot of shit backed up from that. A lot one. of constipation. <laughs> a lot of constipation. And also, Romans were the first ones to like invent like, like sewers. So the fact that they, they did, avoided green stuff. But you know what? They probably had shit on the brain because they were just backed up. So like, how can we get rid of this faster? Let's make a sewer. Or no, excuse me. Let's make a pipeline that we can collect all our shit into and then flush out into a river. Sounds perfect. That's what I mean. That's what that's what equiducts were. Oh, not equiducts, but that's what like the first plumbing was. Right. It was just a big tube that they pooped down into, and then they got flushed out. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Now we're moving on to the Middle Ages. We're talking about four hundred to fourteen hundred. Um, what? 400 to 1400 so a thousand years no i was i was reading the next part oh fall in love from afar so i'm assuming that means that you okay anyway the middle ages were not such a great time for banging because you know the plague uh, <laughs> <laughs> i didn't know how to bring that up any more subtly um anyway the church had very restrictive rules about whom you could bang and when you could get down to it uh, and if you were went against one of these rules by doing anything from having gay sex to having sex with your spouse on Sunday, you could be severely punished, sometimes even with death. I mean, there wasn't enough people dying already. Right. Of course, you can't stop people from banging, even if you make crazy rules about it. And so people in the Middle Ages kept doing it. But the restrictions on sex, as well as changing ideas about things like whether marriages should be arranged by families or voluntary, led to the creation of the concept called courtly love in the late 11th century. Any ideas of what you think courtly love is before we go forward? I would assume courtly love is... I just want to see what he thinks it is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I could be like way off. <clears throat> it's okay. No and judgment. I feel like that would be involuntary love. Involuntary love? Yeah. Like rape? No. But like <laughs> arranged marriages. Oh. Sorry. sorry. He said involuntary love. What? Uh, Blake? It's a whole different topic, brother. My bad. Uh, no, you're fine. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> Do you want to expand upon that at all or just want to move forward? We'll move forward. Okay. Courtly love existed between two people who were not married to each other, but probably were married to other people. Oh. So cheating. Or an affair. Bastards. Typically, the female in a courtly couple was the noblewoman in a marriage set up by her family. Her male lover may have been a tr troubadour, knight, or other man of a courtier class. The man put his feelings for the woman into songs or poems, celebrating their emotionally elevated, the love which they were doomed to never fully express as a married couple. La... In fact, uh, though it involved constant declarations of eternal love, courtly love seldom involved actual sex. It was a precursor to what we call to what we now call emotional cheating. But as a common subject in art and entertainment, courtly love changed many popular ideas about love and romance. And many of the rules of courtly love, like that suspicious that suspicion of beloved gen generates whatever. Um, oh no. That, like that suspicion that beloved generates jealousy and therefore intensifies love, and thought of the beloved never leaves the true lover, are still popular among teenagers, immature adults, and characters in romance novels to this very day. So, okay, I have a question now, since I read that. Do you believe in emotional cheating? Define emotional cheating so a like, more. I just want to make sure I'm. I don't want to. I don't right. want to tell you wrong, and I don't want to tell the listeners and the watchers wrong. So, 
let me just type it in here. So, um, basically, emotional affairs occur when one partner is channeling physical or emotional energy, time and attention into someone other than the person they are committed in a relationship to. The so, term an emotional affair is used in the media to categorize or explain certain types of relationships. High level of non-sexual emotional intimacy, intimacy in adults may occur with the participants being bound by another intimate relationship or may occur between other people. So basically it's just saying like you're married, but you're spending a lot of time, effort, and energy and emotions into another person that you're not married to. I, I don't know. To me, I would consider that cheating. Okay, so you would cons- you do think emotional cheating is a thing? Okay, yeah. I know there's a lot of, there's a lot of people that disagree with that, saying no, it's like you're just caring about a person. It's okay to care about somebody and blah 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 blah. blah. But then there's a difference between caring about them and attached to them. Right. Yeah, and I agree. As I'm, in, like you're mentally cheating on cheating on your spouse because of the fact that you're having more feelings for this person, right? Than the other. And you're giving them all your attention and not your spouse. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, I, mean, I, I would agree with you. I just, yeah, I didn't know what your take on it was. Yeah. Some people don't and some people do it kind of like it, it's a line. It's a weird like thing. Anyway, um, here we go. So now we're moving on to the Puritan era, uh, 1500 to 1700. So despite what you may have heard from, well, everyone's. <laughs> Uh, everyone's everyone excuse me despite what you might have heard of from everyone puritans did have boom boom time yeah um actually quite a bit so by some estimates one in three puritan brides were pregnant on their wedding days on it on their wedding day they were pregnant one in three some estimates not all and that's not fact sh- that's not actually fact checked um but while this sounds shockingly modern, the average Puritan was also into some stuff that we'd consider an advanced level of sexuality today, like public sex. hey Having sex in a field, forest, or hedge was a normal part of Puritan life, as was having sex in an outhouse, porch, or a room where other people were present. <laughs> an outhouse? That's a little stinky. <laughs> I mean, I guess if you're going down on her, though, you wouldn't tell the difference if it was bad or not. <laughs> I mean, if you want to eat her butt out. Oh, <laughs> ew. Ew. Blake, no. 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 <laughs> um, it's not because they were wildly kinky. There just wasn't a ton of private space indoors, which made sex public as part of a necessity. So, uh, but necessity or not it's still part of american heritage so the next time you hear someone uh, go on about how we're moving away from the original values that our country was founded upon make sure you remind them that many of those early european settlers in america spent like well all their free time doing it in the outhouse (laughs) (laughs) so it's okay to go have sex in a porta potty up you know what (laughs) coachella like have a have a blast um or any i guess music festival Lollapalooza over in chicago oh geez just have sex in an outhouse it's not illegal i think actually it's very illegal <laughs> isn't it oh if you get caught it's public indecency yep yep okay now moving to the victorian era we're talking about well let me ask you this yes sir before we move on okay is it public indecency in an in the outhouse because either way you're pulling down your pants hmm I wonder it's just two people pulling down their pants instead of one um well, let's see <sighs> okay so it is unlikely that an ar- argument that sex is a scheduled part of public setting is not public sex for example a couple having sex in public restroom stalls with the door closed is more or less out of public view but in most state decency laws prohibit sex in bathroom restrooms period so most states in the united states prohibit it it is against the law 
most states. I don't have a chart telling you which one, but most. You can check up your own statute and legislation and all that bull crap. Um, but yeah, I don't know. So it's illegal to do the Mile High Club? Oh, it's, no, that, that's federal. That's a federal crime. Dang it. Yeah, that's, if you, that, that's, you can, whew, that's a big no-no. Having, if you get caught having sex in the, in the, in the bathroom, in the plane, that's a federal offense. Really? Yeah, that is a federal offense and a first degree, like, it's a big, it's a first degree felony. Wow. Or something like that. It's a, I don't know if it's first degree, but it's definitely a felony. I do know that. Well, I guess I'm going to have to get a private jet real quick. There you go. Yeah, because then I can't tell you what to do. <laughs> That's right. Um, but yeah, it's, it's my jet. Yeah, if you, bitch. if you get caught, that is a, it is a felony. I don't know what degree, but it's definitely a felony. It's not a good, not a good time. Interesting. I mean, it's probably a good time, but you're not going to like the <laughs> punishment for it. The after um, effects are bad. Yes. Okay, so the Victoria <clears throat> era, we're talking about 1835 to 1901. Victoria's um, Secret. Yeah, there we go. Uh, Victorian sexuality has become quite uh, the historical hot topic in recent years, as the idea has been popularized by Victorian women diagnosed with hysteria. Um, basically, any physical or mental health issue were treated by being brought to orgasm by doctors with vibrators. Hey. Um, some historians have come out to say that our understanding of vibrators and hysteria is confused, and that while Victorian doctor Morton Granville invented the first motorized massager, it was created only to treat injured muscles, not love muscles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same thing. What's the truth? Were Victorian women prescribed jill-off pills session or jill-off sessions? Whoa. Were Victorian women prescribed jack-off sessions that way doctors today prescribed... Oh, my God. That's messed up. So it's, it's, a, it's a theory that Victorian women prescri- were, were prescribed playtime sessions with themselves um, the way doctors would prescribe a foot ointment. Or is it just wishful thinking? Anyway, the jury's still out, but there is one fact we know for sure. Vibrators, uh, well, excuse me, personal massagers, um, as we know them, were invented in the Victorian era, and for that we must thank our Victorian ancestors, even though they were kind of the worst. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, kind of, but because, <clears throat> see, we had two in the Victorian era, 1837 to 1901, we're talking about the Civil War, the French Revolution, just a bunch of death. Just a lot of freaking death. And a lot of orgasms. Apparently. Uh, yeah, that's, that's interesting anyway. <laughs> okay, moving on. <laughs> So we're moving on to the 1970s. Uh, Though much of the 60s was more of popularizing free love and premarital sex, that line of thinking gets a lot wrong very fast. Um, In the 70s, premarital sex was already quite popular um, from the early 1900s all the way up into the 1940s, 50s, 60s. But then we started to cross a line like playing with the ideas of non-monogamy and it actually took a deep hold in the public imagination in the next decade talk about the 70s mainstream american pop culture in the 70s often openly championed non-monogamous sex even and especially for already married couples who had been previously monogamous so more about the open marriage Uh, And actually, in 1972, the book Open Marriage by Nina and George O'Neill became an international bestseller. It was the first mainstream voice to advocate for emotional commitment without sexual monogamy. Many people followed suit and experimented, leading to key parties. Do you know what a key party is? Nope. Okay, so a key party is where you would go to each other's homes. You'd have a, a bunch of people over, a bunch of couples, and then you put your car keys into a big bowl, right? And then you would draw a car key that was somebody else's car key. And then they would, whoever had your car key, you would swap. Interesting. Yeah. So like, let's say you had a wife and you went to this party and um, one of your friends and his wife grabbed your key and you had theirs, you would sleep with his wife and your wife would sleep with him. 
Dang. You'd swap. So that's what a key party is. And it's probably going to explain it. But so parties which couples attended to swap partners. That's pretty much what it was. As well as heterosexual clubs uh, focused around swinging, like New York City's famous Plato's Retreat, which opened in, the ni- in 1977, which followed in a long time tradition of being a gay bathhouse. Lovely. Yeah. Though this era of open marriage, I- open marriage experimentation is often remembered as a cultural misstep, it opened the door for today's take on non-monogamy, which is basically the same thing. I mean, it's pretty much what how it works today. Like, if you're gonna swap or swing or whatever, like, there's not there's not like a whole party based around it, but it's basically the same thing. Yeah. <clears throat> Any questions? I don't know if I could ever do that. <laughs> I probably couldn't either. No. I actually, I know I couldn't. I get too like. But, uh, that's my girl. Yeah, pretty much. So you ain't touch her. <clears throat> nah, uh, 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 uh. Anyway, um, moving on to the 1990s. That's, uh, okay. Um, <laughs> so, lest you think S and M was popularized by Christian Grey and his dad jeans, uh, know that the practice experienced numerous profiles booms through the 20th century. Uh, bondage, power exchange, sex, play. Uh, had a long existence as underground endeavors, and they periodically surfaced as a mainstream t- trend in the 1950s, being photographed uh, featuring Betty Page or the hit 1986 movie Nine and a Half Weeks, which was basically the Fifty Shades of its day. Oh. Uh, but s and really surfaced for air in the mainstream or in the mainstream during the 1990s. It's S&M and its stylistic trappings from vinyl fetish clothes to whips as accessories became quite trendy. With a 1992 Versace collection called Miss S&M leading the pack, S&M scenes were used to sig- signify danger or cutting-edge cool in a variety of TV shows and movies during the decade. So much so that the 1994 Rosie O'Donnell movie Exit to Eden parodied the trend. Oh, Rosie. Major publications like the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune, and Spin sent reporters to cover the new trend, or bondage and sadomachism. Ah, oh, it's... You know, God, you don't know how to pronounce it. Um, No offense. This guy. Sodom... It's sodomachism. Sodom, sodomachism. I don't know. It's it's like sodomizing, but it's... Anyway. Leading to countless undercover reports from writers who, attend, who attended S&M clubs and penned shocked articles about how everyone was running around spanking each other. <laughs> <laughs> Come here! So they're writing articles about how everyone's spanking each other. Lovely. Um, you try to pronounce that word. No. Just try it. No. Just once. <gasps> Sodomachism. So- Sodomachism. Sodomachism. Hey. Sodomachism. All right, Sodomachism. There we go. Got it. Sodomachism. Hey, guys. So I think that I'm completely right in these next couple minutes and try to get Blake to pronounce the wrong form of this word. The correct pronunciation is sadomasochism. And it's the psychological tendency or sexual practice characterized both sadism and masochism. Okay, well, um, enjoy the insanity. That is this word. Sure. I got it. It's That's correct. I, yeah, <laughs> sadomasochism. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay, I'm going to read this over for you guys so you can understand what I was talking about. Okay. Major publications like New York Magazine, the Chicago Tribune, and Spin sent reporters to cover the new trend of bondage and sadomasochism, leading to countless undercover reports for from writers who attended S&M clubs and penned shocked articles about how everyone was running around spanking each other. There you go. If you want to look up sadomasochism, the word of the day, sadomasochism. sadomasochism. You, <laughs> you went sadomasochism. Sadomasochism. Try it. Sadomasochism. No. Sada. Sada. Masa. 
Masa. Kism. Kism. Sadomasochism. Sadomasochism. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got this. We got this. Sadomasochism. Sadomasochism. There you go. Yeah, say it like a song. Sadomasochism. Sadomasochism. No. <laughs> Sada. Sada. Masa. Masa. Kism. Kism. Sadomasochism. Sadomasochism. Not kissum. <laughs> You're not kissing somebody. Kism. Kism. Sadomasochism. Sadomasochism. Kism. <laughs> Gosh. Damn. Sadomasochism. 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 Well, masochism. Yeah, maso, maso, whatever. There's a no. Yeah. Sadomasochism. Sadomasochism. Margarina. (laughs) Sadomasochism. Try it. Oh my gosh. You got this. Sadomasochism. No. (laughs) Sadomasochism. Oh, now you're going to be messing up. Yeah. Sadomasochism. I hate this word. Sadomasochism. Say it slowly. Sadomasochism. Did close. I not say it right? That's close. Sadomasochism. Sadomasochism. There you go. Okay. Sadomasochism. You're trying so hard right now. <laughs> okay, wait. You, Next. You, 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 you got it. Just try. Do, go. Sadomasochism. Sadomasochism. <laughs> <laughs> Don't think. Just say it. Sadomasochism. Do you know me? Yeah, I know. <laughs> It's okay. Sadomasochism. Sadomasochism. <laughs> Sadomasochism. Sadomasochism. Are you going to kiss him? Are you, kiss, are you kissing me or something? with Sadomasochism. Sadomasochism. No, wait. I said it wrong. Sadomasochism. Sadomasochism. Damn it, Blake. <laughs> Fuck you. Sadomasochism. 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 Sadomakaka my hanamaha. <laughs> okay, we're moving on. Sadomakaka. Sadomakaka. <laughs> Sadomakaka. Sadomakaka. Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Any hoosers. And of course, Madonna got on the action. You guys uh, probably course. not even on the same track with us anymore at this point. <laughs> They're like, what the f- They're like, what is happening? Something about spaking and sadomakakism. <clears throat> S- <laughs> sadomasochism. Sadomasochism. Can you say Sada? Sakamatikism. <laughs> Can you say Sada? Sada. Masa. Masa. Kism. 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 Sada Makasism. Damn it, Blake. <laughs> Sada Masakism. Ah. Say Sodomize. Sodomize. Was that Russian? What the heck? Sodomize. Uh, say, say Sodomize. Sodomize. Okay. Now say Sada Masa. Sada Masa. Sada Masakism. Sada Masakism. There you go. We got I it. Thought I, okay, I'll say it again. Sadomasochism. <laughs> you, you can't say it without <laughs> help. Like you have to walk him through the whole thing, then he can say it, and then you have to go, and then you can't do it after that. Okay, do it. Go. Sadomasochism. No, think. Sadomas. Sadomaka. That's not right. <laughs> hey, you caught yourself though. You caught yourself saying it. Sadomasochism. No. Sism. No, it's no, Isn't. it's sadamasa, 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 sadamasa. See, like the oh, so sadamasochism, so sadamasochism, sadamasochism, sadamasochism. Yeah. But you can say like sadamasochism. It's just like really quick. Sadamasochism. Yeah, that's really close. Yeah, you're. That's wrong. close enough. You go. That's close enough. Go one more time. You got They're this. really getting tired of this. You got, I know you got this though. I'm getting tired of this. I'm running a bit into the ground. Go for it. Sodomakis. Okay, we're moving on. We're yeah. done. <laughs> okay. Um, so if you want to know what the word sodomasochism is, just go look it up. It's, it's sodomakisism. No, <laughs> it's not. Okay. Anyway. Uh, and of course, Madonna got on the action. She adopted the persona of S&M dominatrix for much of the early 90s from her 1992 book, Sex and Album, Erotica. Uh, to her 1994 video of the song Human Nature, in which she and a bunch of black vinyl clad dancers run around spanking each other to extremely limited erotic effect. Do you enjoy spanking? Um, getting spanked or being spanked? Getting spanked or being spanked? 
<laughs> I mean, I mean, spanking or <laughs> shut up. Well, I, I mean, think both, dude. Right. I've got the word sadomasochism <laughs> stuck in my brain now. Uh, no, so like, um. I don't know anymore. <laughs> like, <laughs> we spent like seven minutes on the word sadomasochism and you still can't pronounce it. Sadomasochism. God damn it. <sighs> if you like this episode of Audio, <laughs> make sure to like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. iTunes, Spotify, or watch it here on YouTube. If you're watching it here on YouTube, make sure to like this video so we can keep bringing you fun to give you content like this. I'm going to go fuck off and we'll see you guys next time on the podcast. Sadomasochism. Sadomasochism. <laughs>